Good morning and welcome to uh, our second session for skills sustaining your practice. Um, this program is an extension of our original skills artist toolbox program that we did last year. And with this program, we just wanted to expand on some of the skills and tools we presented in our last session and in our last series, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, in our last series, we kind of left off with um, business and budgeting and issues um, related to, you know, once you've gotten an opportunity, how to make it work for yourself. And so with all of our sustaining your practice, we're really focused on building your career up from kind of the ground floor of having, you know, your essential toolbox presented and ready for you. So um, our last session was called the hustle funding your practice, where we kind of talked about case studies and issues within um, a group of three artists, myself, Juan Matos, and Amanda Bradley. And so with this session today, um, we're moving kind of on to the more legal side of things. And we really wanted artists to have um, access to kind of an information bank of necessary um, information to have ready for yourself when you do kind of venture into the um, professional art world. So you kind of know where um, you can and can't do things um, understand what your rights are and things of that sort, understanding terms. And um, so I'm really excited to have Alan Gins Ayers here with me today. Alan Gins Ayers is an attorney here in South Florida and also um, a dancer. She runs the Legal Art Link at Locust Projects. Um, and Legal Art Link is an amazing program that gives artists um, a who are at the partner level uh, a year of pro bono legal services through Legal Art Link, um, which I, from when, when I worked there, I learned that that could be any legal services. It's not just like limited to things related to your artistic practice. It's anything that you might come up for you. So welcome, Alan. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to have you. Um, and I'm really excited to have um, our artists learn from you. Do you want to share anything else? Hey, thanks. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks so much for, um for having me this morning. Um, so as uh, you mentioned, I am an attorney and a dancer. I fondly like to call that um, a ballerina. Uh, I grew up in California. I got my undergraduate degree at Barnard College, Columbia University, where I majored in economic history and I minored in dance. Um, I then went on to Georgetown University Law Center where I got my GD um, and also started dancing professionally with a company in DC. Here in Miami, I am in my ninth season as a dancer and, um, oh. and also currently the uh, rehearsal director of a contemporary dance company called Dance Now Miami. Um, and as you mentioned, I'm also the Legal Art Link Director at Locust Projects. So in that capacity, we, I, um, you know, speak to artists who are facing legal issues, um, either talk them through the issues to the extent that we're able to, um, with the limited resources that we have in our program, or match them up with volunteer attorneys uh, who work with, with our program and who have volunteered to, to give their time to artists. So I think, you know, uh, when you asked me to do this talk, I, I thought about the best way to present some information would be to sort of go through some of the most common questions that we receive in our program um, on a very general level, so that um, you know artists can can consider these things and, and think about them intentionally as they go through um, the business side of their practice. I think that you know a lot of these legal issues come up in the context of artists considering themselves as um, participants in a market and business owners. So that's sort of the context in which a lot of these legal issues come up. Yeah, so this is great. I'm very excited for this. Um, I'm gonna learn a lot, I know, because I, as much as I know, the legal side of things is something I constantly kind of push off to other people. And so I'm really excited to, to continue with everything today. So um, one, just like a housekeeping thing, I encourage you to use the Q&A feature for questions and the chat feature 
for saying hello. So go ahead and like say hi to the other participants, say where you're coming from, if you'd like to share that information, um, talk about your work a little bit um, and introduce yourself there. And we're gonna go ahead and start the presentation with this conversation. Um, also with your questions, I encourage you not to go too personal with those types of questions. Those are things that if you do wanna go into a deeper conversation, you can connect with Alan in, a future, in the future, just because, you know, uh, disclosing personal information <laughs> about legal issues right in this chat is probably not the, the best. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again, and then we can go ahead and start talking about legal stuff. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. And thanks for that reminder. Um, so I, I did just put the link to the legal art link intake form into the chat. So if something comes up um, during this conversation where you're like, oh, that's actually something that I would like to speak in detail about, feel free to, to submit a form to us um, and we can set up a, a meeting. But you know, any questions that come up in this format would not be a confidential send setting. Um, so you you definitely want to reserve any of um, you know those details or or um, you know specifics for a, a confidential conversation. So that link is there. Should you um, find the need to use it, but yeah. So I think we can go ahead and get started today's program. Um, get technical understanding legalese. Um, I will say that understanding. This, this may turn out to be understanding when you don't understand or understanding when to um, you know, get some technical advice or um, specific opinions about things. So you know, the goal today is not to teach you how to be your own lawyer necessarily, but sort of to teach you how to have an, an eye for the, the most common uh, issues that come up for artists and, and you know, when to ask questions and seek additional help. I think we can go to the next slide. All right, yeah, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was um, business organization and whether and how to form a formal business entity. So just, you know, as a, as a very, basic level, um, a, a business entity is a, a legal entity. So people are entities and then, you know, creating a business entity, you file with um, the state of whichever jurisdiction that you're wanting to incorporate your business under. So, you know, Florida, in, in the state of Florida, you would file on, um, many of you are probably familiar with SunBiz. Um, that's the, the location where you would create your um, business entity. Other states have different websites for doing so. Um, so business entities are organized under state law. So they're um, a function of, of each individual state. Uh, you can have a business in one state and, and um, you know, operate that business in other states that does require filing to do so with the state that you're you're doing business in. So, you know, if, if you've recently moved or you have an LLC or another business from an, another state, you can use that same organization. Uh, in Florida, you would just have to apply to do so with um, the state that you're conducting your business in. Um, so we've sort of framed this as um, limited liability companies in sole proprietorships. These generally tend to be the the main decision that individual artists are making when when they decide how to you know operate their business uh, there are other forms of organizations as well which we can get into but these are sort of the most common for individual artists so i think we'll start with sole proprietors so this is sort of the default if you're getting paid in your own name so you know if you if you are maybe just getting started out and you, um, you know, sell some work under your own name, get paid to yourself. Um, somebody writes you a check to your own name. Um, you fill out a W-9 using your own social security number. Um, and then you receive a 1099 for um, the, the payments that you, that you received. Then that's, you know, you've, you've conducted business as a sole proprietor. So under a sole proprietorship, you yourself, are doing the business, there's no distinction 
between the owner of the business and the business itself. They're one and the same thing. So it's not a separate entity. It's just you doing business. Um, so you would contract in your own name. You would get paid in your own name. You would handle any disputes that come up in your own name. So the benefits of this type of, or of operating this way are, um, you know, the, the ease, you don't have to apply for, you don't have to create anything, you don't have to file, you know, to establish, um, you know, the entity or to uh, file annual reports, which would be required if you had a formal business organization. Um, you also have all of your all of your payments and expenses just go into your own taxes. So that avoids um, what can sometimes be a double taxation if you, for example, had a corporation where you would get taxed at the corporate level and then you would get taxed again for your profits and, and what you make um, as income. The a significant drawback, however, is that operating as a sole proprietor has very poor liability protection. Um, which means that, you know, if you, for example, had a contract and, you know, something came up, you didn't complete it and, you know, God forbid somebody, you know, wants to bring a case against you and, and sue you for, for money that they lost in a business um, setting, then they could potentially also go after your personal assets because there's no distinction here between the business and the personal. So if you own a home, if you own a car, um, if you, your personal bank accounts would be a source that somebody who had a judgment against you from a business um, side would be able to, to collect from. So that that's sort of the main drawback of operating as a sole proprietor, even though it's you know the default and most easy way that, that people certainly get started out, but also um, you know, tend to, to continue to use if um, they don't you know, think about creating a business entity. Which brings us to the LLC, which is definitely, definitely the most common organization structure that individual artists use. So um, the, the main benefit of having an LLC versus a sole proprietorship are, of course, um, what I just mentioned, the asset protection element. So in this instance, there is a distinction between the owner of the business and the business itself. So as long as the owner is following corporate formalities, which means, you know, keeping their, their accounts separate. You can't use your business um, credit cards to pay for your personal meals and vice versa. So as long as you're keeping those funds separate and using them for their distinct purposes, then, you know, that situation that I described where somebody gets sued in a business capacity and then that person is able to recover from their personal assets wouldn't happen you would those would be separate um there is a peculiarity in florida law whereby single member llc's so one owner are treated a little bit different than multi-member llc's but that sort of goes in the reverse direction where if if you're sued in your personal capacity then um in florida they the the person may be able to go after the business assets. Um, so it, it may be, you know, worth it to consider having a, a small minority portion of your business owned by somebody, a family member or a spouse um, who whom you trust to have, um, you know, to, to receive that portion of, of your, your business, but it does provide a little bit of extra protection rather than a single member LLC. Um, there are also, you know, once you have the business entity, you can, once it's established, you get a, a separate identification number from the federal government, which is separate from your social security number. It's called an EIN, an employment identification number. And so that would be the number that you put on forms when you're being paid. Um, 
And that's the number under which you could open, for example, a bank account for that business and put things under the business name so that it just creates a, a different, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, corporations being people, but in this context, you can, I think you can just think of, <laughs> of your limited liability company as a, as a, a, a business person in the, to the extent that they can own things and an open account. That's really good to know. Uh, I didn't know that the the a smaller LLC could run in that way, where it, there could be legal recourse for a personal issue, which is I think really important because I think um, yeah uh, there are there there's this kind of myth amongst artists where it's like oh I have an LLC totally separate so like that really helps that really clarifies yeah. That. Yeah, so I think um, it's really important to remember, you know, just having an LLC doesn't automatically create that liability protection. You do have to follow mm -hmm. and keep things separate. So if you have an LLC, but you're using the business funds and the business credit card and the business accounts for your personal use, then you kind of lose the, the protection <laughs> that you would that have that, you know, that it's intended for because you're not using it in the way of that course. it's so it's it's definitely you know just by having an LLC that doesn't um, it's not necessarily the same thing. So I, I saw a question about an S corporation, and yeah, so there are some other business forms um, that are not LLCs. Yeah, so corporation is definitely one of them. Um, an S corporation that S um, refers to a tax designation rather than the structure itself. So the structure would be a corporation, um, a for-profit corporation under Florida law. And then corp corporations can elect to be taxed um, as a C corporation or as an S corporation. And S corporations are taxed the same as LLCs and that pass through. Um, so all of the income and expenses get reported on the, the owner's um, individual returns rather than having a separate um, separate tax for um, the C corporation. But corporations also do have the, those um, liability protections um, over a, a sole proprietorship that an LLC provides. They also though have um, more corporate formalities. So usually there's a, you, you know, you're required to have an annual meeting um, to to vote on certain things. So it, it really depends on the how it's set up. Um, but it's it is a little bit more technical in the setup process and the running process than an LLC tends to be. LLCs have have a lot fewer um, formalities and requirements that they need to follow. Um, um, so before you move to the next, oh sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Um, I was just noted, so I got uh, a message that there was something up with like the screen, like for some reason you all can see my Zoom like boxes. So I'm gonna try to reshare the screen before we move on to try to fix that issue so it's not so in the way. So let me try again. Don't know why it's happening that way. Okay, let me, let's see. Um, if I turn this off, okay. I'm not going to try to get too fancy. Just okay. Let me see. Um. So, are you still seeing? Yeah, I don't see the huh? gray box anymore. Are you seeing the box too? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Okay, so it's gone now. Yeah, there is like a gray box sort of in the corner. Um. But yeah, yeah it's the it's it's my Zoom controls for some reason. I don't know why they were showing my Zoom controls on the screen. I didn't realize that. Okay, so gone. Okay, so we can keep going. <laughs> All right, yeah. So um, I did just want to mention one other type of um, sort of default business organization, and that's a general partnership. So um, if you are in business with another person, um, rather than being a sole proprietor, um, the default is that that creates a general partnership where both people are jointly liable for everything that. Uh, they do in their business together. So um, I just wanted to mention that as well. So if you, you know, are in a collective or, or working with other people, um, it's 
uh, generally a good idea to have some sort of operating agreement that you know establishes the respective responsibilities for everyone who's in that uh, business together. Okay, I think we can go on to the next slide also related to business organization. Yeah, so this is something that's come coming up um, a lot more frequently, I, I think, uh, you know, especially with respect to the gig economy. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of um, cases and, and testing of this independent contractor employee relationship. Um, and there is a lot of misclassification in the art world and in the creative context. So um, it's important to con these are important things to consider both in the context of if you are working for somebody, if somebody's hiring you, and if you're hiring people to work for you. Because um, you know if you if you have employees, um, you don't want them to be in a situation, or or you want to understand the risks of potentially misclassifying somebody as an independent contractor when they're actually an employee. So I think there's. I've, I've come across sort of a misconception that, you know, just calling somebody one or the other or how you pay somebody is what makes somebody an independent contractor versus an employee. But what it actually is, is there is a question of control. How much control does the hiring hired party have over their work? So for in an employee employer um, situation, the hiring party has more control. So they, you know, they, they're telling the employee when and where to work, what their schedule is, what, what how and what exactly they will be doing. They'll, they'll get paid a regular wage. Um, and in that context, um, there's, a, there's a lot of employment law um, that comes into play. So anti-discrimination, wage rules, um, you know, providing health care, things like this um, apply much more in the employee employer context. Um, there's all, and then, so an independent contractor, by contrast, the, the hiring party has less control. So the, um, you know, generally that would be more for specific projects. Um, the, the, um, the contractor would be able to control the manner, time, and place that they're providing the services. So it's more like, you know, they're, they're hired to do a task that they would do on their own time, not necessarily like you show up at this place in time um, to, to do these things. And then they are treated as self-employed and responsible for their own taxes. So a situation where this, you know, um, misclassification happens a lot is, um, in the performing arts context, right? So if you can sort of imagine a, um, you know, performers get hired for in, into a company or for a production, there's a, a rehearsal schedule, they're being told exactly what to do, what to wear, what to provide, the, the job that they um, are, are responsible for is, is controlled by the the directors or the producers of that um, production. So oftentimes they're still paid as independent contractors and that can be a situation of misclassification. Now, if that misclassification is reported on the employer side, um, they can be responsible for back taxes um, that they did not withhold because they were being, they were paying the people as independent contractors. So um, I think it's it's important to consider if you're hiring people and um, you know want I, I can certainly understand the want to avoid um, you know paying tax, taxes that you wouldn't otherwise be responsible for if you're paying somebody as an independent contractor. But that question should really be is is this person treated as an employee or am I treating them as an independent contractor? And if it's an, as an independent contractor, you know, that, that involves giving up a little bit more control over how that person is doing um, their work. Um, so yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's certainly situations where there's, there's close calls to make or, um, you know, it, 
the same work could be done in, in either context. So, but it, this is it definitely, um, you know, something that comes up often and something to think about in, in, when you are being hired and when you're hiring others. I kind of have a question actually about this now personally, because I guess I've never seen it written out this way that like is very clearly showing the distinction. Yeah, I mean, like you normally think of it in the tax context rather than like what it actually yeah. means. But that, that's yeah. more of a, a um, the, the taxes are more of a, like it's not the cause, it's the, the effect of the classification. Right. So should we like lean more towards one direction or the other when hiring people? Or is this like always, because like, I think I always kind of lean towards independent contractor, but should I just in case like have some taxes, some like money left over for taxes just in case uh, there's some type of distinction? Cause like with visual arts, it's so nebulous sometimes, right? So it's like some stuff I can just ask someone to do for me, but other times I need them to come be in my studio with me and work on something. Um, so like, it's like, what's the, I wonder, is there a, um, a better direction to kind of just assume you're going in for just safety reasons. Yeah, I mean, um, not I, I, I wouldn't say better or necessarily safe. I, you know, I, I think that if you are hiring somebody as an independent contractor, it's it's useful to think through, um, you know, if you, if if you know, you don't have the money to, to withhold um, the, the federal, the, the taxes that you would have to pay as an employer, employer relationship and structure the work so that it actually is independent contract work and not employee. Okay. Work. Um, otherwise, you know, it, it can get very expensive to have employees. For sure, yeah. <laughs> um, but it can also be very expensive to misclassify. Um, so yeah. I think that if if you are the hiring party and you are hiring somebody as an independent contractor to, and and you're unsure, but that's what that's what you legitimately can do. Then to to think through and structure that relationship so that it is an independent contractor relationship. That's fair. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. And then the last thing that, that we get questions on often is whether somebody should have a nonprofit organization or a for-profit organization for their um, artistic venture. And, you know, this often relates to what are, what are the goals? So a lot of art, especially a lot of art in Miami, I think it's fair to say, is very socially conscious, right? So um, I think where artists are often exploring issues of great social importance um, and that affect the community at large. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the work is lending itself to a nonprofit organization. An artist can be trying to raise issues and make money. Um, those are, are things that can happen <laughs> simultaneously, right? So um, if that's the goal, if the goal is to sell your work and to um, make a profit, then that's a for-profit organization. If the goal is to raise awareness, if the primary goal is to generate community support, to build a movement, to, um, you know, have this collective societal benefit, then that, that's something to consider perhaps a nonprofit organization might be um, the right way to go. And nonprofit organizations, they're eligible for a lot more grant funding. So that's something to consider. Uh, they can receive tax exempt donations that go towards their charitable work. Um, and they, uh, you know, so, so those are some benefits to having a nonprofit organization. Um, some drawbacks, uh, you, you do give up some control, right? So as opposed to having a for-profit, we have, uh, yeah, so as opposed to having a for-profit entity where you're the owner and you can have control and do things very quickly and easily, nonprofit organizations don't have one owner. They have a board of directors who are all responsible 
for making sure that the nonprofit organization keeps its nonprofit purpose and status. So in that sense, um, if, if it's one person's project, they might want to retain a little bit more control and not go the nonprofit route because in that case, you know, you see it all the time where uh, directors get voted out by boards and, and people who create these organizations um, at some point as somebody thinks that their work is not, you know, serving the purpose of the organization, it's possible to be removed. Um, and that does happen, um, but that's sort of on the that cost benefit analysis of having that nonprofit organization. Um, so, you know, if, if on the other hand, there are ways to have um, some benefits of a nonprofit, there's something called fiscal sponsorship, where if you have a, a project um, that you're doing that serves a nonprofit purpose, sometimes a nonprofit organization can act as the um, like the presenter of that project, and they can receive, you know, the tax exempt donations, the grants on behalf of the project, and then essentially hire um, you to to create it um, under their nonprofit status. So that is one way to, if it's sort of something smaller, to um, take advantage of a a nonprofit organization without having one oneself. Um, but you know, this is sometimes we get inquiries about creating a nonprofit organization where it, it doesn't sound like that would be necessarily the best benefit to mm -hmm. um, the project or the artist. Yeah, I think that there's this um, kind of common like assumption that like, if I have a nonprofit, I can get grants. But, and I think that that's where I'll find, like I've had like meetings with artists who are applying to grants um, with, with like jobs that I've worked at and, they'll apply and then I'll be like, oh, you're submitting it with a 501c3. And I'm like, actually, you're not eligible for this grant because you're a 501c3 now. And there's an interesting, um, I mean, this without going too deep, um, but there is opportunities for like social enterprises, which are like hybrid versions of these, which are goes way deeper, obviously. Um, but as an artist, if you're starting a nonprofit for the purposes of like getting grants for your project, you are already kind of like putting yourself at a bit of a loss. Um, because once you become a 501c3, like tax exempt organization, um, you now can only only apply for grants typically with that uh, status. Um, and now if you were like a hybrid or did a fiscal sponsorship, then you can apply for grants for both. But as a, an artist with a nonprofit, the, what issue you'll typically run into is that you're now in a pool of grantees of big organizations that have been doing this for a long time. Um, and unfortunately, you place yourself kind of like a step backwards um, and kind of place yourself in like uh, as a small fish in a big tank in a way. Whereas with fiscal sponsorship, it could be a way for you to kind of see what being a 501c3 might look like by having someone else's tax exemption status that you can apply for grants with. Typically, it's encouraged to um, find a fiscal sponsor who wouldn't be applying in the same pools as you. So they can still apply for things. Um, and, and that usually runs, you run into things like that with um, grants that are like grants for big organizations, for example, like, or grants, like it's nice to get 501c3 status through like a theater org if you're a visual artist because they're not applying for visual arts grants and, and you're not applying for theater grants. So you can actually kind of double up on the grants that you're applying with for the year. Um, they can apply for theirs, you can apply for yours, and no one's dipping into the same pools. Whereas if uh, you're both visual arts organizations, you both are in the same pool. And typically, in a lot of grants organizations, like um, rules, you can only apply for one of their grants for a program. Um, and so you don't want to ever place yourself in that situation. But yeah, I think that like artists choosing between nonprofit or for profit is like a big um, conversation. And I think it shouldn't be reduced to the fact that you want to get grants. Yeah. Um, it should be thought through a lot more than that because the the it is a big tax status and like you can get audited, you get audited much more. Um, what's the word? Like a, a lot more detailed. <laughs> the, yeah. the pen is a little bit finer and they're focusing a lot tighter on you. Yeah. 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 I think that's definitely true. There's a lot more accounting and um, 
that goes into running a nonprofit organization, you have to make sure that all of the expenses um, and income are related to the nonprofit purpose of the organization. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a little tighter for sure. Um, I was, I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, and I, I, th I just think in general from like a, I guess this is going a, a, a bit aside from the legal perspective, but from a, a best practices nonprofit management side, um, you know, it, it's good to have the income be diverse anyway, to have diverse sources of income, whether that's earned income, yeah. grants, um, donations, things like that. So if, if you know, the, the genesis of starting the nonprofit organization is to get grants, then you know, that's, that's not maybe the, the best or most sustainable um, foundation for that yeah. nonprofit's future and longevity. So I think that, you know, if, if it's certainly a, a benefit of having a, a 501c3, but, you know, there are, there are definitely other considerations um, to make and, and foundations to lay before uh, that organization comes into existence. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of wraps up our discussion of business organizations. And I wanted to go into um, so just some things to think about when um, entering into agreements and having contracts. A lot, a lot, a lot of what we see in Legal Art Link has to do with contracts and also the um, lack of a written agreement. So um, I want to hit on a bunch of um, things that come up for us regularly. So the first thing we have is, and this is sort of just, you know, a wrapping up or transitioning from the last um, major topic into this one, and that's who's the party in a contract. So if you do have an LLC or an S Corp or a nonprofit, make sure that when you're entering into agreements as in um, for, for your art, for your business, that that is the party in the contract, not you personally, because if you, you know, have your LLC and then you put your own name in the contract, that kind of negates the purpose of you having the LLC, because now you've just, you know, have put your own personal liability into that arrangement. So just make sure, you know, if you, if you are using a, a business structure that that is the party to the contract rather than you personally. Um, okay, what is or isn't a contract and how are these established? Okay, so what is a contract is not necessarily a piece of paper that says contract on the top and is signed by people who are agreeing to things. Um, instead, the term contract is sort of a general term for a legally binding agreement. So that's an agreement between uh, some parties that, uh, you know, can be upheld in a court of law that people can be compelled to do things or pay money if they go against this um, arranged arrangement that they've, um, you know, come to an agreement on. Contracts can be established orally or in writing. They can also be established by conduct. Um, so an express contract an express contract is established by words. And those, again, those words can be oral or they can be written. Um, an implied contract is established by conduct. So if, um, you know, I, I don't know, buy my friend a sandwich every day and they always pay me five, $5 or say, if I make my friend a sandwich every day, bring it for lunch and they every day pay me $5 over time that can, you know, create an agreement or establish a, a conduct or by conduct establish this arrangement in which I'm making somebody a sandwich and they're paying me $5 every day. Um, even though it, that's never been reduced to words, um, you can imply an agreement um, and a, a meeting of minds of, of people through their, through their conduct. Um, and even if there isn't a, contra a contract, you can sometimes get um you know some damages or, or money award in a in a situation where you where you provided some benefit to somebody even if there's not you know technically a, a contract or an arrangement between the parties um under some quasi contract claim so it's like close to a contract but we don't actually have 
an agreement, um, some things called unjust enrichment, quantum merit, but basically like if you've done something for somebody and they're benefiting from your work, even if you didn't have a specific arrangement, you can um, sometimes get the value of what you've contributed. Um, when is writing necessary? So some contracts do have to be in writing. You know, some can be established orally, but there's, um, you know, some do have to be in writing. And those, um, for example, include real estate contracts. So you can't sell your house or enter into a mortgage without having a piece of paper setting forth the terms. Um, that makes sense. <laughs> Contracts that can't be fulfilled in a year. So if you have an ongoing project or you're hiring somebody or you're having a relationship that's going to be going on for more than a year, um, that should be in, that has to be in writing. Leases for more than one year. So um, you know if you are renting a studio and your lease term is longer than 12 months, then that would have to be in writing. Um, sale of goods exceeding $500. So if you're selling, um, you know, goods, so, so some, something that people are, are buying from you for a, a value of more than $500, that should be in writing. Um, and in addition, some copyright agreements do have to be in writing. So assignments of copyrights, giving your copyright to somebody else, work made for hire agreements for independent contractors, those have to be in writing. Um, so there are some things that have to be in writing, um, but, you know, uh, I said sale of goods. So if it's, if it's services rather than goods, um, then, then that doesn't have to be in writing. Um, and sometimes with visual art that can get a little, uh, the lines can be, be a little tricky. So what is the value of, of the good versus the value of the service if something's being commissioned or, or originally made for somebody. Um, but in general, you know, we we recommend reducing agreements to writing. It's it's much easier to establish um, that an agreement was made. But even if you don't have a signed agreement, even as I said, you don't have that piece of paper that says contract at the top and both parties signed it. Um, you know, having a, a meeting of the minds can be established by a text message or an email. So if you have a, an in-person or a phone conversation with somebody where you discuss the terms of a business arrangement and you agree to them, then I definitely re recommend, you know, if you're not going to have a written agreement, sending a follow-up text or email confirming what was discussed. You, it, you know, we had an, we had a discussion and I, you know, you agreed that you would pay me X dollars and I would do X, Y, Z for you. And I would complete it by this time. And this is how you're going to pay me. Um, and just having that, you know, established, you know, maybe they write back and say, yep, sounds good. Maybe they don't respond at all. But if you do, if you have that piece of writing that confirms an, uh, an oral or an in-person conversation, which can be incredibly difficult to prove existed, if, if one side says it did and the other side says it didn't, and, and no one you know, overheard that conversation, then this can be an important piece of proof when you're trying to establish the existence of a mutually binding agreement. Um, what should you have in your contract? Okay, so just as some basic uh, things to, to think about, what are the, the usually services, but, but also, um, or, or goods, you know, if, if you're selling a piece that you, that's already created, what is the exchange that's happening? What are you responsible for? Are there any specifications that you have to meet? Who has creative control? Um, it, are they able to reject something or request changes? Um, how, so how is that work being completed? Um, the timing, when does the project need to be finished? Is that super important? Can you change that? Can you amend it? Is it a hard deadline? And if you don't meet that deadline, is it a breach of the contract? Um, any conditions? Does the project rely on anything to happen before it can move forward? So for example, sometimes you have conditional 
projects where, you know, say, say an, a, an organization is applying for a grant and then they're trying to set up, you know, the, the arrangements in case they do receive those funds. Um, so, but that contract will only come into effect if, if the project is in fact funded. So that would be what's called a condition precedent. So in order for this agreement to come into effect, something needs to happen. But once that thing happens, then the agreement will come into effect. Um, payment, how much is payment? When is it due? Uh, are the, is there an installment plan? Do, um, is there a portion that's due upon signing and a portion due upon completion or, or other sort of increments throughout the length of the project? Um, I generally recommend, recommend to artists a mechanism for handling late payments um, just because this incentivizes, you know, people to actually pay upon completion when it's, when it's due. Otherwise, you know, if there's, if there's a late fee or, um, you know, a percentage or, or something like that, then um, it, it just encourages payers to be a little bit more prompt and then you don't have to, you know, come to Legal Art Link and ask them to, us to send a letter demanding payment for something that's been owed to you for a while. Um, but so, you know, having something that incentivizes on-time payment in the contract is generally a good idea. Um, and then an ar arrangement of intellectual property. So who has control over the IP that's related to a work? So oftentimes artists will, I think we, this might be in the next slide, but artists will get agreements that um, have a work made for hire provision in them. And they don't realize that they're actually signing away ownership of the intellectual property of, of their work. So there's a, there is a distinction between ownership of an object and ownership of the underlying intellectual property or copyright related to that object. So copyright are our rights related to, um, so intellectual property covers what one can do with the, uh, the creation itself. So making copies, distributing them, licensing for reproduction, um, making, you know, sales of, of copies of the work. You know, if you have a, a painting, putting it on, on t-shirts, on merchandise, selling those, making copies, making art prints, um, that would, those would all be the intellectual property rights, which somebody doesn't receive merely by buying a copy of the work. So if somebody buys a painting, they're not then allowed to, um, you know, reproduce that painting in, in art prints and, and sell them at, you know, a fair. That's not part of the um, ownership of you know, having that that singular uh, object, just like you know, it when you buy a, a book, when you buy a novel, that doesn't give you the authority or permission to copy and reprint um, and then resell the um, you know the book. I think people understand that with non-visual art sometimes a little bit better than with visual art. But um, so, how are your contracts arranging for intellectual property, and are you retaining it? Usually, we recommend that artists um, retain the, the ownership of their copyright, or in an instance where the the hiring party or the the client really needs ownership because they need to be able to modify or, or do things, then um, that should be reflected in the, the cost of um, the contract. So, you know, having, selling an object is different than selling your rights to the underlying copyright embodied in that object and you should be paid accordingly. So that should be a, a higher amount for selling the copyright than it would be for just selling the object itself. Yeah. And to, to that point, I also, um, a lot of those competitions that are like online competitions from big companies and um, there's other like art artists who um, are like a merch contest where you make a drawing or you make a design for something. A lot of those um, in submitting, you're agreeing to giving them the intellectual property for mm -hmm. that piece or for that work. Um, so just be aware of that. 
those contracts are also usually like pages and pages of three point font. So I understand why a lot of people don't read those terms and conditions, but um, typically in those cases, you're kind of giving that away immediately, whether you win or not. Um, so just th certain, sometimes I don't think people think to read the contracts oh, yeah. on those on those fronts, but a lot of those competitions, they're built right into the contract uh, yeah. from just submitting the project. So when you, I say, I say that only because it's like, when you submit to that, know that like you can't use it ever again on one end, but also know that you don't want to put so much work into that, you know, don't work for on that for three days, um, knowing that if you don't win, you still can't even use it for anything. So just yeah. being aware on both sides of it for yourself. Yeah, I, I've never read one of those agreements, but that's definitely a, an important cautionary tale. Um, you know, whether whether you win or not, that's, that's the, you know, and, and if you're giving up the rights to something, then that means that you you yourself don't even have the right to, to use it. So I think that that's, um, you know, it, if nothing else, just look for in those agreements, how they're they're dealing with intellectual property. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, and then, yeah. So here's some terms, specific terms to look out for in your agreement. So I think we, we already discussed work for hire and that's generally related to um, ownership, initial ownership of the work itself. So typically what happens under copyright law is the person, the author of the work, called an author um, under copyright legal parlance, even though we typically think of authors as book writers, um, just anyone who's creating a work under copyright law is called an author. Um, so the, the author of a work is the initial owner, and then that person can you know, change ownership through assignment of, of that copyright. Um, in the employee-employer context, so this is another reason why it's important to make that distinction between in, uh, independent contractors and employees. When an employee creates a, a copyrightable work under the scope of their employment for their employer, the employer is deemed to be the author of the work. So say I work for Disney as an animator and I'm an employee of Disney. My, and part of my employment is that I have to draw things for them. Um, you know, then Disney owns what I do at work. Makes sense, right? Um, but that's just, you know, sort of how copyright works. So if your job as an employee is to make copyrightable works, then your employer is actually deemed to be the author and the owner of those, um, those works that you create under the scope of your employment. If it's not within the scope of your employment to do those things, then, you know, that's, then that's, that's the question, right? Whether it's, whether it is or is not within the scope of your employment. Independent contractors, however, um, they, need a written work for hire agreement in order for the the contracting party the hiring party to um own that work so you know having keeping an eye out for for work for hire um provisions in your contracts is definitely a good idea similarly assignment of ip so um Sometimes these work for hire provisions will say, even if this work for hire is not valid, then this person agrees that they will assign their ownership of the work um, to, to us. So, um, you know, work for hire assignment of copyright, those are definitely um, buzzwords to look out for. Um, I think I mentioned this also, but payment plans, um, making sure that there is a mechanism for how you're being paid um, for projects and for work. Something that's becoming more common is mandatory arbitration. And what that means is that if something happens, these contracts require um, that the disputes be resolved in an arbitration setting um, and before you can sort of 
go to court. So it takes away your ability to enforce your contract rights um, in, you know, small claims or, or county courts. So it's becoming increasingly common, but it's definitely something to look out for. Um, and then, you know, in the event that your work involves or to the extent that your work involves pieces of high value, it's it's worth it to um, you know consider who's responsible for maintaining insurance. Particular this particularly comes into play when um, you have maybe a consignment agreement, or um, you know are sending work somewhere. So if somebody is has custody over something that belongs to you, or, or they're trying to sell it. Um, you know, in the process of sending that work, in the process of them having custody and control over it, um, it also makes sense to, to arrange for which party is responsible for ensuring that work and making sure that if something happens to it, um, that there's a policy that it's covered under. So um, I think that comes to the end of our presentation itself. So I'm, I think we should open up to questions now, kind of see what um, has popped up for everybody. Let's stop sharing. Yeah, just a reminder, um, go <laughs> keep it, What's uh, just a reminder, oh, yeah. keep it as, as general as possible. And the link is there um, if you want to discuss anything specifically um, in a confidential setting. Yeah, so you can go ahead and put it in the Q&A or the chat. Um, since both are active at the moment. Um, if you have any questions about the conversation. Um, thank you, Alan. I learned I learned a lot of things actually. A lot of, you know, I think it's, certain words get thrown around all the time. And I think that there's always an assumption of like, everyone kind of being on the same page, but that's not always true. I think sometimes like there's certain things that I definitely forget or I'm not thinking about as much. So um, I'm really glad we were able to kind of, you really helped me kind of parse through those uh, thoughts a lot today with this. Um, and it's really helpful to, to really feel like you're on the same page with the people who are presenting things to you. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, we want to like empower artists in our community to be able to answer questions about their work, um, ask for what they need, um, clarify anything, um, and also ask about their contracts and things too, because you know contracts are, they feel really intense to sign a contract, whether you trust the person or not. Um, and so feeling like you know everything that you just read, like you understand everything that you just read is really important. Um, so do we have any questions? I don't see anything popping up in the chat at the moment, but I'll give it some time. Um, yeah. yeah. And then we also- To sign agreements very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, taking, um, you know, looking through agreements, highlighting things that you don't understand um, yeah. and, and trying to, to make sure you, you know what you're agreeing to is, is super important. Yeah, and it's also, um, I think artists always kind of feel like they have to like do everything themselves, just like figure it out, like I have to be the um, troubleshooter in every side of things, but with legal stuff, I implore you to let someone else do some of that sometimes, yeah. um, as often as you can, and I think that's why Legal Art Link is so important, and I always like mention it to artists whenever like there are questions or thoughts about certain things, I'm like, if you, you know, the last thing you want to do is place yourself in a situation where you've made an assumption. Um, I think that that happens a lot. Um, I love artists and I love the people that I work with, but artists definitely, you get told something by some people and then they, those, because that one person told you that, you might just like be like, oh, I guess that's how it works um, because they're an, a smart person who is part of the field. But even I sometimes forget certain distinctions. I mean, the LLC versus sole proprietor distinction, I forget the details of that all the time. And so always seeking out more information and asking. Um, so we did have a question about what is the difference between S Corp and C Corp? Yeah, so that's a, again, that's a tax designation. So um, S Corps are taxed, it's called pass-through, and I'm probably the, the next talk will cover this. 
um, in more depth. I think that the accounting or, or two talks from now, I'm not sure. I, I know you're speaking- Yeah, about taxes that. is the last one. Yeah, so the, I think that they'll have a lot more information about how this works exactly. Um, but S-Corps are taxed as pass-through entities. So all of the income and all of the expenses get reported on um, an individual's tax return, just like a sole proprietorship. Um, a C-Corp, the corporation itself will file its own taxes and then the individual will file taxes on um, a salary that they're paid and then any profits that are distributed to them as an owner. So that is a, a tax designation. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, um, there's so many options, <laughs> like for choosing how you want to identify on taxes. Um, and I think that like really getting the details about every distinction is really important um, because that can definitely guide you into the, the right direction. Um, I say that a lot because I, th I really think that the desire for to just be a nonprofit is so big. Um, oh, I see another question about, so if you have an LLC set up, can you use the LLC for two businesses? For example, um, if the LLC is a rental business, can you use the LLC for your art business as long as you're bookkeeping is separate. So um, you, the, the answer is you can, but in that situation, you wouldn't have limited liability between the two businesses. So you would have liability from yourself to the businesses and businesses to yourself. But if one LLC, if, if the rental LLC got sued for something and the art LLC had a lot of assets, then they would, they would be able to go after the assets of the art LLC or vice versa. So having a different entity protects each of those entities from liabilities of the other. So you, you, you can certainly use an LLC for more than one purpose, um, but just know that those, those um, two purposes would be under the same liability umbrella um, rather than be separate. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, which kind of defeats the purpose of like the, the or the benefit of the liability uh, distinctions, I guess, in some ways, because you don't want to ever have one thing be at risk because of another. So you don't want any of those um, overlaps. But it's a very good question. <laughs> um, so I think we have some more time for a few more questions if there's anything else that's come up for anyone in the process. And also, I'm going to reshare the link for um, for the legal art link intake form, because I think I really do encourage you all to um, have form like a personal relationship with the program and get better information about it um, for the, I guess, like the cost, which so the partner level of, of at Locust, is it still $60? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and sixty dollars. What's that? Oh, I was just gonna mention we also have been doing open office hours on the first Thursday of every month. So you can find that on the Logos Projects website and just sign up for a um, a half hour time slot. So if you have something that's and those will be with me. So if you have something specific that you want to talk about, um, a specific issue, or if you just want to talk through you know, your, your practice and your business model and what kinds of things should you be thinking about and what kinds of things could you be doing um, from a legal perspective, that's what the, those open office hours are for. And um, again, first Thursdays of every month between two and 4 p.m. We have uh, four half hour slots. That's very good to know. Um, Cause that, I mean, I might actually come <laughs> talk through some things on my, on my side of things. Um, so I'm going to give, pose one more, uh, if there are any questions, so them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, I think we should probably wrap up shortly. Um, so I'm just going to, again, if you have any questions, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. um, is there any other thoughts that you wanted to close with, Alan? Um, you know, I, I think that I don't know, legal things can be scary. There's a lot of, of terms and 
uh, a lot of a lot of very poorly written contracts that are just almost impossible to understand, even you know, having gone to law school and practiced law. So um, I think that you know, have I, I just want to make sure that people know about Legal Art Link as a resource. Um, we, you know, certainly, if you're if you're think it's never too early to um, to reach out to our organization. Um, and you know, the earlier the better. It, if 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 um, it's much easier to prevent a um, a dispute or a situation from happening than it is to to solve one once it does. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the basis for why I always encourage people to have contracts, even with your closest friends. Mm -hmm. It just helps to know. It, and in some ways, it's like, yeah, it protects you legally, but it also helps to identify um, everyone's needs and boundaries. And um, as hard as it might seem to like place these kind of legal um, precedents over like a relationship, um, in the same ways that on a personal tip, uh, boundaries make everyone feels safer and ev makes everyone feel heard it's even better in like a legal side of things in a professional setting yeah. so there you're, you're you're not nothing's being lost in translation if it's all on paper between the two parties and they've agreed to it you know yeah expectations are are so important in any any relationship and you know having having a, a conversation about um you know a contract or an agreement or an arrangement and just establishing what those expectations and responsibilities are is, you know, a, a, a good practice to have, even if it, it having that conversation seems like it, it would be uncomfortable. Yeah, I agree. So I don't see any new questions pop up. Um, so I'm going to assume everybody has gotten their, their thoughts out and concerns out. Um, I will be sharing some like more resources related to this conversation in our last one. Um, in email, so, and I'll be sharing the archive for this program also via email for everybody to rewatch or share with anyone who might need it. Um, I want to, again, thank you, Alan, for joining us today. This has been very helpful for me. Um, and I, I do really encourage you all to look at the intake form if you need anything right now or join the office hours and reach out to Alan directly. Um, actually, I'll put Alan's email in the uh, it's just legal legal link at Locust Products, right? Yeah. So I encourage you to reach out to Alan, ask questions, um, and feel empowered to do the things that are best for your practice. So uh, I hope this helps. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> have a great rest of your Saturday, yeah. everyone. Yeah, go have like a drink and go to the beach or something. Well, no, don't go to the beach. It's spring break. Never mind. Um, go to a pool. <laughs> go to a pool somewhere oh, far away from spring break. <laughs> All right, bye, everyone. Bye.